In this episode, I'm going to speak with Kevin Conrad, the executive director of the Coalition for Rainforest Nations. This is the All-in-One Financial with Bill Holiday. We discuss financial planning issues such as investing, taxes, estate planning, insurance, retirement planning. And in this series of episodes, we're focusing on charitable giving, effectively giving. It's brought to you by AIO Financial, a fee-only fiduciary financial planning firm working with clients all over the U.S. at AIOfinancial.com. Thank you for joining me for this episode. I'm glad to have this interview with Kevin Conrad. He is the executive director of the Coalition for Rainforest Nations, which is a nonprofit focused on low carbon growth in developing countries emphasizing sustainable management of tropical forests. Their mission is also impacting climate change, fighting climate change through this strategy. All right, let's go to the interview. All right, thank you, Kevin, for joining me. I appreciate it. No, I'm, I'm really happy to be on the show, and thanks so much for the invite. I actually came across the Coalition for Rainforest Nations as one of the more efficient ways or effective ways to fight climate change. Several studies have shown it to be pretty effective. So I wanted to get information. If you could start by telling us a little history, a little background about what you do. Of course. I grew up in Papua New Guinea. Uh, my father uh, was a linguist, so he was very concerned about the loss of uh, indigenous languages. Being an adventurer at heart, he tended to want to save the languages in, as deep as possible in the rainforest. <laughs> so I grew up my entire life sort of in, in the rainforest. And when I, uh, you know, I had to go away to school. So I went to California to begin and studied finance. And it just became clear to me that I had more to do with my life than sort of be a pure financier making money for other people, uh, just for their retirements, et cetera. But you know, if we could figure out ways to save the rainforest, it was personal to me because these were family and friends that were, were struggling in the rainforest, trying to figure out how to survive. And at the same time, I felt an obligation to use my skills to help them. So one thing, you, you know, I want to talk a little bit about why we should care about rainforests. And how, yeah. and how my perspective is a little bit different than others, maybe. And that has led to sort of our effectiveness, I guess. So how long ago did you start the Coalition for Rainforest Nations? You know, it was started about probably 18 years ago. It was my thesis in grad school. And we had to write a paper uh, about, you know, anything that interested us in, in terms of a thesis. And this whole question of, you know, how do you help indigenous communities develop, have health, have education, have safe places to live without destroying their forest. Because classic economics says you've got to cut down the forest and plant something, or you've got to cut down the forest and sell it. And that was the only way they could develop. And I was just, I was struck by how can we protect these traditional livelihoods without having them to destroy the world that they love. And that became sort of my thesis in grad school. Gotcha. Well, why don't you start with that, with why should we care about these forests? And, and I see that it's you're not just looking at one region. This is pretty global. You're looking at right. forests uh, in several Everywhere. continents. Everywhere. What became clear to me after doing due diligence as a classic sort of finance person was that the approach the North had been using, which was project by project, was never going to solve the problem. That if you focus on you know, your acre, it's easy for our brains to understand, but it's never at the scale that we're doing. And it was an interesting observation or comment. There was a guy called Pete Seligman, who at the time was the, the boss of Conservation International. And he gave me this, when I was in this due diligence, he gave me this visual picture. He said, listen, if you line up all the projects that the world has forced areas that they've conserved, it makes a line around the equator about a mile wide. And he said, you know, that is an accomplishment. But if you look at deforestation and you put that strip around the world, it's basically 30 miles wide. Yeah. And 
So, you know, we've done so much work sort of bite by bite, but we're losing the battle. And so that's what sort of took me to this. If we can't get this done at scale on a global scale, if we can't do it at that level, all we're doing is just delaying the inevitable, which is all the rainforests are going to be gone. It's just a matter of time. So that was a, a sort of, I guess, a very different approach. And it gets to your original sort of observation. Why have we been more effective than others? Was that we we started with this has to be done on a global scale, and then it has to be done country by country. And then from country to country, it has to go from state to state, and then community to community, rather than community-based and hope that we get there. So what is your approach? I mean, are you taking these yeah. tropical countries and working with their, the governments to protect? Yes. The so what changed the paradigm was, trying to find a place where all these governments were already participating and that had a rule set that would encourage them to conserve their forests but create an incentive to do that so most poor countries cut their forests because they're trying to develop it's not that they're criminals it's not that they're bad people they're doing the same thing as americans do which is hey if i have a huge unutilized forest in my backyard let me cut those pine trees and sell it to the logging uh, you know, the local logging facility and wait for them to grow back again. So communities, poor communities are only touching their forest because they know uh, no other way to survive. But the forests have so many ecosystem services they provide humanity that we have ignored. Uh, they're, they're what we call classic market failures. So we know that, that rainforests make clouds that, that cause rain. And a lot of those storm systems start in the, the equator from the rainforest and they come up and they provide rain for the US. So if we destroy those rainforests, we lose a lot of that weather system, but we haven't thought about it that way. We're not helping to conserve the forest so we keep having rain, right? So that's an ecosystem service that we haven't valued. Forests also clean dirty water. So, you know, they make a sort of, if you keep your rainforest alive and healthy, the water that comes through the river systems is clean. The only time it gets dirty is when we cut down the rainforest and then the soil and, and waste washes off and goes into it, right? The other thing that forests are doing is that they're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and they're putting it into the soil for us. So forests and natural service systems are the largest sink. They're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere every day for us for free. We're not giving any value to it. And so that was my observation, which was, could we get these ecosystem services, value them, and then give that money to the communities that are protecting the forests. Thank you for helping our weather systems. Thank you for helping us provide clean water. Thank you for protecting our, our endangered habitats. Thank you for pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. How can we pay for those services that your forests are doing for the world? So you're actually looking at partnering some of these countries with countries that are receiving a benefit but don't necessarily have the forests. Right. So the, 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 the place that we started with was the, the, the UN Climate Treaty. So this is, you know, uh, President Trump is famous for his first day saying, I'm pulling out of the Paris Agreement. Joe Biden is saying, the first thing I'm going to do is put, me, put us back in the Paris Agreement. We, we spent 15 years negotiating a, a framework that has been agreed by the US, by Europe, and by all the rainforest countries that says, listen, if you provide data for us on all the forests in your country using satellite imagery using whatever and if you can show us that you are a slowing rates of deforestation or b increasing force in your area we will give you the carbon value of that work okay now we started this 15 years ago and this is one of the reasons we're selected as the most effective uh, group in the world when it comes to for uh, forest and climate Developing countries, as we sit today, have reduced about 8 billion tons of carbon emissions from slowing their deforestation. So that means we have stopped probably, let me just do the quick math, probably 400 million hectares, which is now about a billion acres of forest from being deforested in the last uh, 15 years. So that's because a huge number. Because you're compensating them to keep it there. Exactly. So what we're saying is you're cutting it to make money. What if we pay you money to keep it? And the developing countries have accepted that bargain and have done it. The trouble is 
we only they've only been paid about four to five percent of the emission for the work they've done so this is where you have the president of brazil saying hey i did all this work stopping deforestation it was under a un treaty we were supposed to get some money for it we haven't and so i've got to tell my farmers go back to selling the the same old commodities you sold before and it's not because he's a, a crook well i can't speak for whether he is or isn't but it's not that he has an unrealistic proposition. He's just saying, we had a deal, the money never came, so go back to plan A. And, and that's where we sit today, is, and what we're working on now is keeping developing countries with this great momentum and, and getting to the point where we can end deforestation globally in the next 20 years, and that's our goal. Yeah, that's pretty ambitious, that, that's great. But why, <laughs> why did the money get held up? Two reasons. The first is the global economic situation. We've been in a in a little bit of a what I call economic down, you know, sort of chugging along for a while. You know, there was the 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 housing bubble that sort of blew up. Climate sort of got put on the back burner while everyone restructured the banks, etc. There's still a little bit of you know people are there's you know are still a little bit concerned. Now we've had the pandemic. There have just been so many other what I call broad financial challenges that providing finance for developing countries has been put down the list. The, the sad part is that if you look at what we have to achieve to keep the world at two degrees or to try to keep it at 1.5 degrees, forests, if we actually funded them for the next 10 years, could do all the work. So mm. just by conserving forests, we could get the emission reductions that are necessary and give ourselves 10 years to start scaling up renewables. It's that powerful a tool. And we have the machine built, but we just haven't figured out how to get the finance where it needs to go. So it's really funding that's holding it up from developed countries. Yes, or, or if every American person decided to offset themselves personally, saying forget, you know, I just want to be carbon neutral as a human being. We would be probably 75% of the way to getting us on track. If you add, oh, if, if every European and every American did that, we would have every decided I'm going to become carbon neutral and I'm going to sort of pay for my carbon emissions at five bucks or whatever else it is. We could get there. So governments have a role, but so do people and so do corporations. Do you have an idea of the impact? I mean, what would it cost a person to offset a typical American lifestyle? The average American, and, and when I say average, you know, it's like your average GDP. So the average American makes $45,000 a year, right? The average American emits sort of 25 tons a year. So if you, if you multiply that by five, you're dealing with, uh, you know, 120 bucks a year, right? Or 10 bucks a month, and you're carbon neutral at $5. So these aren't cost oh. prohibitive pro prohibitive numbers and there are other ways you can do it too. Most people's emissions are through their their cars and their homes. So if you put that same price on the on the gas tank, a gallon of gas, it's another 3 or 5 cents per gallon and you're carbon neutral driving your car. So whether you do it, you know, directly or whether you do it through the services you buy, it's not a cost prohibitive thing. Yeah, no, not at all. That's that's very reasonable. So, and is this pretty accepted from the nations, the the developing nations with rainforest, to participate and to? I mean, it sounds like they're sacrificing quite a bit by not deforesting economically. Yes. Yeah. You know, when when we started, um, I think it was only Costa Rica that had an aggressive payment for. Uh, in a sort of forest services program. And, you know, Costa Rica controls about, well, less than 1% of the world's rainforest. In the last 15 years, we've scaled that up. So through what the work of the coalition and the mechanism we set up under the Paris Agreement, we're now over 93% of the world's rainforests are participating. So, oh, wow. we've, so we've gone from sort of 1% to 93%. The trouble is, if we don't continue to support them, that dial is going to keep going all the way back down to zero. If if they really, you know, if they're sacrificing their rural communities and they don't have the income to support them, you you know, a Malaysian logger is going to come in and do a deal and and the forest disappear again. 
No, I could see that in a lot of these countries, they probably don't have the, the economic cushion during a pandemic or an economic cushion to, or, or there's probably a lot of pressure for them to make what they can. It, 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 there is, and, and as politicians, you understand, right? If a politician encourages them keeping their force, and by doing that, all he does is impoverish them, the next election he's gone. So it's right. a very dicey political situation. We have to help these governments be able to provide the services that their communities need for the work that those communities are doing, saving the you know saving their last great rainforest. The, the wonderful thing is we built the machine. Is I feel like we have almost a Ferrari. It can actually go at 150 miles an hour if we just put the right gas in it. We have all the countries that are ready to go. They have the satellite imagery, they have the systems, they've got everything in place that we've been building over the last how many years. And all we haven't figured out is where to get the gas. Right, right. Actually, let me ask a question. I don't know a lot about forests, so th this might be naive, but is there an alternative responsible foresting practice so that the com countries can make money and keep the carbon benefit? Yeah, it, it depends what you're measuring. So if you're measuring only the trees, as it were, the, I would tell you the answer is yes. What happens though, when we deforest, we lose a lot of the biodiversity and we lose the habitats for the animals. Mm -hmm. We lose a lot of other things. So if, you, if all you did was measure carbon, I could tell you, yeah, uh, plant a tree and it will regrow, do the math, you make the money, twice, you make the money selling the wood, you make the money when the, as it's absorbing the carbon later. And if you keep going, that's sort of carbon neutral, which is fine. But what we find is you, each time you deforest, you lose a lot of biodiversity and it takes a long time for the habitats to recover. So what we've been doing in, in, in the other sense is to say, le let's pay for standing forest to stay and let's go to those degraded areas. Thankfully, we as humans have destroyed so much forest already that we can go to those degraded areas and try to rehabilitate them. Mm -hmm. And that's an improvement, right? By taking, trying to rebuild a forest in an area that was no longer forest, that's doing a positive thing. Just taking a, a native forest, deforesting it and trying to replant is net negative. Is there a trend or reason that there is deforestation? I mean, is it for grazing land or is it for just selling lumber? Is there a, a, yeah, a typical we, reason? Yeah, we call that, the drivers of deforestation and they vary sort of country by country and region by region. So I'll just, I'll give you a couple examples. So in Brazil, one of the largest drivers of deforestation is beef. McDonald's buys a lot of beef from Brazil. Now for them, because they have a lot of land, it's easier for them to just deforest as they grow their herds to give them more grazing land than it is to feed them corn or grain or anything else, you know, to, to allow them to keep growing on a fixed area of land. So as business people in Brazil want to become richer, they tend to deforest to grow their, to grow their herds rather than in America, we figure out ways to be more productive with the existing land we have. So that's an example in forest. An example of the area I grew up in Papua New Guinea, it's actually shifting agriculture with expanding family sizes. So I'm going to explain that a little bit. When I grew up in Papua New Guinea, they would tell me on this hill, you can only have a garden that is 50 feet by 75 feet because we've been here for, for 5,000 years. Actually, I've been there for 50,000 years. And we know how this forest recovers. The minute we get bigger than that, invasive grass comes in and forest never recovers. But if you keep it this size, the, the seeds will come in and the forest will cover. Now, back in the day, they were having eight kids and only three were surviving. Now they're still having eight kids and with health, eight are surviving. So now yeah. they, have to build, they have to build their, their forest to feed eight kids that are going to survive, not the three. And the, the forests are getting bigger and now they never recover. The, the, the for, the, the, all those principles that they knew, the invasive grasses are coming in, the forests don't recover. So if you look at the satellite images, the forest is shrinking, not because of logging, but just because uh, of, of uh, shifting agricultural practice. Gotcha. And just population growth is yes. pushing that. Yeah. And what, in some of these countries, I, like in Brazil, if, 
you own a farm, the the rainforest isn't protected land. You can just expand into it. Brazil is a is a huge country, and there's a lot of quote unquote government land that isn't policed. So mm -hmm. Brazil and Brazil, you know, uh, I don't know if you you know, sort of the 40 acres and a mule. Um, you know, there was a time in U.S. history where if if you would go out to the unsettled areas and do a farm, we will give you 40 acres to farm and we'll give you a mule. And Brazil is a little bit in that development cycle. So there's a lot of rainforest area that they would say, listen, if you go out and actually provide a farm out there and provide a regular tax income for us through selling your agricultural products, you can have, you can go take that land and we'll give it to you. So, it, you know, it, it's hard to judge a developing country based on where the U.S. is today. We sort of have to go back in U.S. history. Where were we when we were sort of at that time of development and what were our policies? And you find a lot of developing countries are doing the same thing now. I get it. So they're actually, government can actually be encouraging the deforestation to help the economy. They are. A government minister will say, I have all this land that I can see that is giving me no tax revenue at all and is not helping the communities. So I would rather use that land. Let me sell the wood, burn the wood, whatever else it is. Do I need it for energy? Do I need it for exports? And now I have land where it now will become a taxable resource that helps us grow. And so if that's the only construct they have, you can't blame them for doing it. What we as a global society have to do is to say, can we give you a different economic construct, which is can we value that forest for it at, alive rather than only value it when it's dead? That, that's great. So, so the biggest issue you're having is you just need funds. Yeah, you know, government, there, there private, are, however. Yeah, and there, there, what I call sort of two buckets of funds. The funds that we, the coalition, use are helping countries actually do this. So, how do you set up the policies? How do you set up the land, the the laws? How do you actually measure your forest area loss? How do you count the carbon? How do you, you know? the coalition helps them with all of those issues. Then there's a second bucket, which is now that you've successfully done it, how does the rest of society come in and help you actually pay for those ecosystem services so that those forests can stay standing? Gotcha. So do you have staff in a lot of different countries working with governments? No, we, we, we are light touch. We try to we work directly with the governments. What what we find is the minute you drop an office in the capital, you end up taking capacity away from the governments to do it. So we intentionally will only send teams to train and then to follow up and provide support. But we want the governments to own this. We want the governments to be doing it and to be setting the policies. What we don't want is to become a proxy for them. And that's that's gotcha. where a lot of NGOs go wrong. They're like, oh, we've got to go over now to this country and save the elephants. In the end, they start saving the elephants. They don't work the governments. The governments end up fighting with them. And then you end up with this pitched battle between the, you know, the different groups. Our whole view is unless the, unless the people want to save their own assets, it's never going to happen. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, have there been countries or areas, regions that are easier than others for you to get traction and, and get this going? So there, there are what I call sort of two lenses to assess that under. One is what are, what are the land ownership policies? So Papua New Guinea, for example, 97% uh, of the land is owned by the indigenous communities. And the law is very clear. You can't touch that land unless you work with the, the indigenous owners of the communities. Typically what we find in those situations is if you can provide an incentive for those communities, they will engage. If you go to the French colonies, for example, such as the, the DRC, the French set up the law that the government owns all the forests, but yet then they don't have the cap capacity to care for that. So now you have theoretically communities who've lived there before there ever was a government who are you know, basically saying the government's not here. So if someone comes and says, I'll pay you for your trees, they say, fine, let the government come and stop it. 
So what we find typically is when the land ownership is held by the government, deforestation goes faster. The, the, other, the other puzzle for that, other than land ownership, is the effectiveness of the government policies themselves. So for, for governments that have capa- capacity to actually enforce and implement their own policies, you see them being very successful. But you know, even if you have very good policies, but the, you know, the, land, it, the land ownership is murky, it becomes hard. You can, if the land ownership is clear and you have bad policies, you can still be effective. So it's it's you can't really say one versus the other, but they're both they're both very important. No, that makes sense. And I like the idea of the the two approaches. One is get countries in shape, ready to go, and the other is yeah. to get funding to keep them on track. Right. And you know, I think it's it's a it's a common human condition that if we respond to negative incentives, such as don't speed or you'll get a ticket, right? There's a you, you know, there's a negative incentive, but we also respond to positive incentives, which is take red meat out of your diet every single day because it's plugging your arteries, right? Uh, or whatever it is, right? Any, or, right. or you know, pay pay your taxes on time and we'll give you some refund uh, as part of that. For the, so positive incentives really work as well. And that's what we're trying to work with these governments rather than saying you're poor, you're corrupt, you're, you're all this. We're just saying, look, we don't even want to get into that. If you do this, and we can we can verify it. You should get the positive incentive. We're not here to make judgment on you. We're here to help you do it. We're help, to help you be successful to do it in an ethical way. But but if you do it, you should get the compensation and just provide a positive incentive and let the countries figure out how it works in their own their own situation. No, that's great. I, I did come across the the reducing emissions for deforestation and forest degradation mechanism. Is yep. that a measurement tool of measuring yes. impact or? Yes. Yeah. So it's called Red Plus, And y- you have to blame me for such a, a, a bad acronym. But the, the way you go in these UN negotiations is you have to put an agenda item that has a title. So I created a title when I was thinking about this and trying to put it on the UN agenda. You know, can we Stim it pro- incentives to stimulate action to reduce emissions from deforestation and degradation. So then it become reduce emissions from deforestation and degradation, and it became red. And at that time, sort of the what was that Jack Nicholson movie that uh, a few good men and they were doing the code red or whatever. And I was like, uh-huh. I can't use I can't use red. That's like you know. Anyway, the plus came in when India came to the negotiations, and they said actually we've pretty much stopped our deforestation. Our biggest problem now is to rehabilitate weak forests. So we need to conserve forests, we need to enhance forests, and that became the plus. So causing deforestation hurts the climate two ways. One, the deforestation puts carbon in the atmosphere, but two, it reduces the forest area that's pulling carbon out. So you you have to pay you, you want to pay for people who are actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere as well. That makes sense. No, this is fabulous. If listeners want to learn more, where's the best pe- place to get information? I think the best place to start is our website. Our, our website isn't the best website, and let me explain why. And that's that you can just say cfrn.org or coalitionforrainforestnations.org or rainforestcoalition.org. Either way gets you there. Keep in mind our website is designed for the countries we work with. So we're telling them that we can help them monitor their forests. We're telling them how successful they've been as a collective group in conserving their forests. We're telling them the instruments we're setting up for them to help save forests. We're in the process of developing what I call sort of an outward facing, which is to talk to people to say why you should help these countries. And that's still under development. So if you go to our website, just understand it's developed for rainforest countries and we allow you, there's a place to donate and support our efforts there, but also understand we are trying to fix the website to make sure we can tell more information for people who are interested to help. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> About who your target audience is. For this. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Our, our first work was saying, can we just, no one believed we could get developing countries to stop deforestation. I mean, I was laughed out of rooms. You were never going to get developing countries to stop deforestation. And we have uh, at a huge scale. 
And now my problem is they're so successful, I got to go find the money for it, um, right. and, which is a great problem to have, actually. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like you've done a lot of the hard work to get to this point. And then it's, exactly. Uh, and, yeah. and now it's just help, helping them can keep doing it and keep doing it faster. And that's the fun work. That's great. Well, I really appreciate your time, Kevin. This is a, an exciting project, and, and I appreciate some information about it because that's a, it keeps coming up as the, the most efficient or effective way <laughs> to stop climate change. Yeah, and, and that's just, one, because rainforests have so much carbon, and two, because we've just taken a different way to look at it that we just want to push the pedal on a global scale. And thankfully, we're at a place in human history where we can now. That's that's wonderful. Well. Definitely. I wish you the best continuing your work hey, Bill, and, you. and appreciate your time. Thanks, Bill. Uh, this is a pleasure and, uh, you know, happy to, happy to come back if there's anything I can do to help. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for listening to AIO Financial. We will be posting this to the Impact Financial Planners podcast and video channel as well. This has been brought to you by AIO Financial. If you need help with any part of your finances, please contact AIO Financial for a free meeting AIOfinancial.com. We have a free SRI ebook about sustainable, responsible impact investing. It's at impactfinancialplanners.com backslash SRI ebook. We do appreciate any comments, questions you have. You can comment where you find this blog or video or podcast. Or you can go to our site, AIOfinancial.com, for contact information. And if you do like these videos and podcasts, please subscribe to our channel, leave a rating, share. We appreciate it so that they can be found by other people with similar interests. All right. Take care of yourselves and uh, thank you.